Let's pray. Our Father God, Lord, we thank you for this morning. This is the day that you have made that we can we can be glad in it to worship you, Lord. And、I、want to pray for our nation,、uh, especially for those countries that are in war, Lord. We ask you. To watch over the people there, that they can be spared and have、uh, safety, even though they're doing the war, and continue to help uh, that uh, those、uh, leadership and those government、uh, they can、uh, seek you and repent in front of you. And Lord, we also want to pray、uh, for our church. For our church body, that、uh, we as we continue to pray to seek for our senior pastor, our、uh, EM pastor, and our children director, Lord, we、uh, ask you to、um, continue to grant、uh, a servant in your favor、uh, that you can bring him or,、uh, or her to among our midst. As we worship this morning, Lord, continue to.、Uh, Help us to focus our heart in you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.、Uh, let's rise for worship.
to Thee. Uh, uh, let's please be seated. Let's pray. Dear Father God, Lord, we thank you. Indeed, it's your love and your salvation that you lay your life on the cross to save us. As we sang the song just now, you have set us free. Indeed, you have set us free from sin and bondage. We want to give thanks to you. And Lord, we also want to Pray for uh, our brother and sister, especially uh, our seniors uh, in church uh, who are weak, uh, in flesh. Uh, we want to remember our sister Sydney uh, for her continued treatment after her chemo. That she's under uh, hormone therapy uh, uh, for her cancer. Lord, we ask you to continue to strengthen her and Pastor Will and Aaron, so that they can continue to rely on your strength each day, and that uh, uh, Cindy can uh, restore her health. And I also want to pray for uh, our brother uh, Wang Fu from the Mandarin side, and also uh, sister Yu Gui, that she's under uh, dialysis uh, routinely. We also ask the family to continue to those who care for her, Lord, we ask you to, uh, to ask you to strengthen them and be with them each day, so that they can rely on you, as we do each day. And today, want to uh, dedicate our service to you, that you we may find favor in your eyes. And Lord, we thank you for this day that we can come as a body to worship you. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. And happy Chinese New Year. <laughs> yeah. And today is the uh, second day uh, for the Chinese New Year. So welcome home. Yeah, that's the tradition. And again, also we want to uh, welcome uh, uh, John and Rebecca just come back from Japan. <laughs> they just actually arrived last night. So <laughs> so uh, it's, 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 uh, they probably still have jet lag. And uh, we also also to welcome uh, new friends among us. Uh, we have two new friends here, and I don't know if uh, 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 can we uh, welcome you. Uh, uh, your name, please. I'm sorry. Diana's oh, Cindy's okay. friend. Oh, Diana's and okay, welcome you. Yeah, that's good. And uh, and uh, we also have another brother. You've been here before with us. Oh, okay. And your name, please? I'm Derek. Derek? Okay. And that's me. Okay. So we can wel welcome our new friends later on. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, just a brief announcement for this morning. And one important one is next week, our Sunday uh, on the 18th, uh, will be our congreg congregational meeting. And uh, on the meeting, we're going to review last year's. Uh, uh, we're going to review the financial report from last year and then approving the new budget for next uh, for this year. Uh, so uh, uh, the membership list is uh, posted in the bulletin in the back uh, on, uh, as entrance to the building, so you can check. And if you uh, if you know that you're a member but you didn't find your name, please let any of uh, uh, the deacon or elder know so we can add it out. And uh, uh, yeah, and. Uh, uh, we'll continue to pray for our uh, searching for our pastor, uh, also EM pastor, and uh, uh, and the next will be uh, uh, <coughs> as usual. Our uh, pastor Frank Makia is with us today to share God's word, and uh, the scripture uh, scripture for this morning is John seventeen twenty one, and uh, the verse is uh, that they may all be be one, just as you. Father are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent us. Uh, so uh, we will uh, give the time to Pastor Makia for uh, God's words this morning. Uh, 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure, as always, for me to join you all for worship and to share the Word of God with you. I, I very much appreciated the music ministry, the songs. Uh, they were wonderful, and I, they ministered to me, and they set up the message, I think, very well. Uh, yes, it's one verse. This is usually not what I do. I usually have a larger passage. Uh, but I'm going to be adding to it with some other verses. But uh, this one verse is what I want to focus on this morning. This great verse, divine communion, our eternal purpose. I'm going to read it again. This is prayed by Jesus to his heavenly father in his final hour before his crucifixion. It's a very important prayer because this is right on the eve of Christ's momentous self-giving on the cross. The content of this prayer, therefore, is very important to get at Jesus' own view of his destiny and, and the reason for it. And this is what he prays for his followers, and that includes us, that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Let's ask God's blessing on this verse. Lord, as we focus on this verse this morning, may you bring to our hearts a fresh awareness of the importance of communion of a unity in life and in the sharing of life with you, in you, and with one another, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This verse could be called Christianity's revolutionary idea. That communion is at the very essence of God and that God's destiny for the human race is to partake of that communion together. I want to repeat this. This is Christianity's revolutionary idea. I have not found it in any other religion that God is at his very essence a communion of love and that God created humanity to partake of that communion. This verse could be called our human destiny. It is for this communion. It is for this reality we were made. This is our destiny. And I want you to Pay close attention to Jesus' words here. He says to the Father, As you are in me and I am in you. He's describing an intimate sharing of life between him as the Son of God and his heavenly Father. He's describing a communion of love that is so intimate that the Father could be said to be in the Son, and the Son could be said to be in the Father. They are in one another, completely interpenetrating in a deep and intimate communion of love. You in me, and I in you. And as you are in me, and I am in you, may they be in us. May they find their place in the wide open space, Father, of our love. May this intimate sharing of love and communion between me and you, you and me and I and you, may that intimate sharing of love between us be where humanity finds its place. May that intimate sharing of life between you and me, Father, be the destiny of the human race. 
may they find their destiny in that communion of love. May they find their purpose. May they find the flourishing of their lives in that sharing of life between you and me. This is the reason why we were made. Think about it. And I think I may have mentioned this in another sermon. I don't know. I can't always remember what I say. <laughs> I just know I say it a lot. So I must have said it here at some point. And that is when you read the creation account where God creates humanity in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, you find the creation of humanity in this early account of creation. You, you, you find it sort of come to a climax in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And Genesis 2, 7 describes the creation of Adam. And we are all Adam and Eve's seed. We are all born of Adam and Eve. And when you look at the creation of Adam in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it comes at the climax of a long, lengthy creation account in which God created all things by the mighty breath of his spirit. God speaks it, and by the mighty breath of his spirit, all things, the entire cosmos, comes into being. But Genesis 2-7 brings it to a special climax with the way in which Adam is featured as having been created. And when you read that verse, it becomes very clear that Adam's creation stands apart from the rest. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it talks about how in the mighty presence of God's Spirit, all things are made. But then when you get to chapter 2, verse 7, where Adam is created, something very special takes place. Adam is created in a way unlike anything else. It says in Genesis 2-7 that God, when creating Adam, stooped low and gathered the dust, gathered the dust together into a human being, and then went down and in an intimate embrace breathes his spirit into Adam's nostrils. Unlike anything else was created, Adam is created special. And the first thing Adam must have seen when he was awakened was the divine embrace. God embracing him, breathing into his nostrils the breath of life, Adam is made for that embrace. Adam is made to be taken up into divine love. And when you read that creation account in the light of this verse, in John 17, it becomes clear that Adam was made to partake of that love relationship between the Son and the Father. Father, as you are in me and I am in you, May they be in us. May they find their place in the middle of this communion between me and you. May they find their place right there, right in the embrace of our love. This is our destiny. And we will never know the meaning of our lives anywhere else. We could seek for love and search for love everywhere and with every ounce of our being. But we'll never find the kind of love that fulfills our souls anywhere else but here. In the embrace of the shared love between the Father and His Son. This is the, the destiny we were made for the embrace of this relationship. This is what we were made for. I in you, you in me, they in us. Search for love 
anywhere else and you won't find it. Not in a way that satisfies the soul. Not in the way that really releases you from the hold of sin and the threat of death. This is the only place where you will find freedom. This is the only place in which you will find fulfillment. You will not find it anywhere else. For this you were made. And I would have to say the idea that God is a circle of love, the idea that God is a communion of love at his very essence. He is a communion of love. You can't understand the doctrine of the Trinity any way else. There's no other way to understand it. People are always trying to figure out how is God one and three at the same time and how is God three and one. That's not what the Trinity is about. It's not a numbers game. The Trinity is all about a communion of love. It's about the revolutionary idea that God in his very nature is a communion of love. A communion of love that is for us. That we were made for. And that opened its life to us in history so that we could be drawn in, so that we could know that love and be freed by it and know the only freedom and peace that we could ever know. That's what the Trinity is all about. That's what the belief in the Trinity is all about. It's an invitation. It's an invitation into the divine sharing of life and love between the Father and the Son. There's no other way of understanding the Trinity than that. There's no other way of making any sense out of it than that. And I have studied religions for years and years, and I have, not find that con- I have not found that conception of God anywhere else. That God is essentially a communion of love, and every fiber of my being cries out for that. I somehow intuitively know that this is what life is meant to be all about. Finding this love, being taken up into it, being freed by it, and being transformed by it. Somehow every fiber of my being, my very soul, cries out for that. And the only peace I will ever know is in the embrace of that love. Now you may be asking yourself the question, where does the Holy Spirit fit in? (laughs) We've been talking about the Father and the Son. Well, the New Testament does fill out the picture for us. If you look at Jesus' baptism in Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, it gives you a very strong suggestion as to where the Holy Spirit fits in. The scene is Jesus' baptism. And the account is given for us in all four Gospels. I like... Matthew's account because uh, it it just has a a kind of fullness to it. Jesus is being baptized and he comes up out of the water. And at that moment, God reveals himself. It's as though all the centuries of time reach their climax in this moment because this is the first public revelation of God as triune. And it says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, the heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. Whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. Recall those words in John 17, 21, on the eve of Jesus' crucifixion, where Jesus says to his Father, You in me and I in you, the shared love between us, may they be in us. And here it is right here, 
God showing his love for his son. This is my son whom I love. I in him and he in me from all eternity. Now we are revealing this in time. And notice the role the Holy Spirit is playing. It's not a coincidence that right as the Father is saying, this is the Son whom I love, at that moment, the Father is abundantly pouring out His Spirit upon His Son. As He's saying this, now if I say I love you, and I'm bestowing something wonderful on you as I say it, <laughs> it's pretty clear that whatever it is I'm bestowing is an outward expression of my love. And so if the Father says to the Son, this is the Son whom I love, and He's pouring out His Spirit upon Him as He says it, and that Spirit is empowering Jesus' return expression to the Son, uh, to, the, to the Father, it becomes clear that the Spirit is encircling their love, bringing it to expression, being its ecstatic delight. And so, if we were to expand on John 17, 21, in the light of this text, here's how we would put it. Father, you in me, and I in you, and the Spirit encircling that love, bringing it to expression, and being its delight. This is who God is. At essence, a communion of love. The Father in the Son, the Son in the Spirit, and the Spirit... Uh, <laughs> I'll get it right. <laughs> the, fa <laughs> the, the Father in the Son, and the Son in the Father, and the Spirit encircling that love as its expression and its delight, and the Spirit participating in that love at the same time. God is a circle of love, a circle of love. And what we find here at the baptism of Jesus is that circle of love that is God's very essence. That circle of love shared between the Father and the Son in the Spirit. It's not a closed circle. It's not shut off from creation. It's not like this circle uh, is, doesn't admit anyone else. In fact, what we find is that in creating and in sending the Son and the Spirit into the world, God is opening this circle. He's opening this shared life. He's opening this communion to us. The Father sends His Son and His Spirit into the world to open up that love relationship that He has always known within Himself from all eternity. God is opening that to creation and He's inviting us in because it is for that communion we were made. So the Spirit goes out ahead of the Son <laughs> and the Spirit draws us to the Son so that in the Son we can enjoy that communion He knows with the Father in the Spirit. So he sends forth the Spirit to draw us, we who are alienated and isolated and bound by sin and death, alienated from God's love, living in darkness and isolation. The Spirit goes out where we live and draws us out of that fruitless, barren existence in which our souls cry out, for a communion and a love that we cannot find in ourselves. The Spirit goes out 
and follows us down the lonely and dark paths of our sinful existence, wooing us, drawing us for that communion for which we were made. Drawing us into the embrace of the triune God. Luring us to Christ, which is the only open door to that communion. Because that communion takes place between the Son and His Heavenly Father and cannot be found anywhere else. The Spirit draws us to the Son. Draws us to Him. Standing with Him, we can enjoy that love communion that He has with His Heavenly Father in the power of the Spirit. And so He draws us. He draws us to Jesus Christ. He draws us to the victory that Christ won for us so that we could be freed for communion. So that we could be freed from isolation and alienation. Freed for communion. Freed for that only fulfillment of life we could ever know. So the Spirit draws us to the Son, and in the Son we pray, Our Father, and partake of that communion the Son has always known with the Father. Now it's our communion too. God draws us in all of our unworthiness. He draws us in all of our brokenness. He draws us in all of our emptiness to the fulfillment of life that can only be found in the embrace of that love that the Son knows with the Father in the circle of the Spirit. So that's why it's very interesting. When you look at Matthew 3, 16 to 17, and you have this beautiful picture of God as a communion of love. The Father who loves the Son, the Son who loves the Father, and the Spirit who is the expression of the Father's love for the Son and is the expression of the Son's uh, love for the Father. This beautiful picture of God that you get in, at Jesus' baptism. Then Matthew follows that thread all the way to the end of the book. And how does, how does the book of Matthew end? With a reference to these three again. As the key to the Christian life. So notice how Matthew ends. Jesus, therefore, Jesus appears to his disciples after his resurrection. After the victory of love that he pulled off on the cross and in the resurrection, Jesus appears to his disciples, and here's what he says to them. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Notice, this is how God is named at the end of the book. Father, Son, and Spirit. And we are baptized into this threefold name. Isn't that, a, isn't that significant? How God is named at Jesus' baptism as a communion of love, that's the threefold name we baptize Christians in. As if saying, now that you are baptized, your life will now find its place in the communion of love that occurs in the midst of these three. We are going to baptize you in water in the name of the three who are bound in love together. And it is under this threefold name you will find your fulfillment and your mission as Christians. It's in the midst of this communion that you will find life. It's in the midst of this communion that you will find the purpose of your life, your destiny, and your mission. 
because your mission will be to open up the table of this communion to all nations, to say to them, come and dine with us and partake of this love that we have, not only together, but in God, in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in their embrace, in their communion. That's the table of fellowship. We open to you. And that's our mission. That's our mission. You want to know what the mission's about? You want to know what the mission of the church is about? To open up the table of communion to all people. Because they desperately need it. And they'll not find fulfillment anywhere else. Salvation is communion. It's not just forgiveness of sin. That's a very one-sided view of salvation. It's not just God saying, okay, your sins are washed clean. It's a lot more than that. Salvation is communion. It's living in the embrace of divine love and being changed by it and liberated by it and being able to transcend our selfishness. To live for something higher, something greater, something far more fulfilling. To see salvation as only forgiveness of sins is shallow. That's an important concept, forgiveness of sins. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I'm saved from sin but what am I saved for? Something positive's got to be there. And that's the communion shared in the embrace of the triune God. And that defines the mission of the church. We invite people to come to abandon their loneliness and their emptiness and their alienation and their isolation and to find their way into the divine embrace that takes place within God. Come, come, come by the Holy Spirit, find Jesus and find in him a love with his heavenly father that represents the only path to freedom we'll ever know. Come and dine at the table of fellowship. Not just with us, <laughs> although that's important. But with us in him. Live within that prayer Jesus prayed, our Father. Our Father. And know his love in Jesus and in the power of his spirit know the father's love and find it liberate you to love back in a way that you never thought possible this is Christianity's revolutionary idea God is a communion of love And it's the only love that will satisfy the soul. So divine communion in the coming of Jesus Christ moves decisively from eternity into time. This love shared between the Father and the Son in the power of the Spirit that love always was. It didn't pop into being with the coming of Jesus <laughs> like it never existed before. It's not like God was ever simply a solitary being. I remember when I was in Sunday school as a little kid, the Sunday school teacher said to the class, and I never forgot this, it stood out in my mind. Sunday school teacher said, you know, before Jesus was born, 
God the Father was lonely. He didn't have anybody. He was so lonely. I remember feeling sorry for him as a kid. Poor, poor God. <laughs> he didn't have anybody. So he had to create Adam, and then he had to create Jesus so that he could have some fellowship. <laughs> what a needy God. <laughs> well, here's the good news. God was never needy because God was a perfectly fulfilled communion of love throughout all eternity. He didn't need Adam to know fellowship. He didn't need that. God was always fulfilled as God from all eternity. He was the fullness of love. He created as an overflow of his love, not because he needed anything, but because he was so abundant. He sent his son and his spirit into the world as an overflow of his love, not because he's needy, but because he's so gracious, so loving, that it overflows his very being to create, and he creates for our benefit so that we could come to know that love and glory in it. He didn't create for his benefit. Uh, God is already perfectly fulfilled. <laughs> he doesn't need fulfillment. He wasn't lonely, but he created and he sent his son and spirit into the world as an overflow of grace, as an overflow of love so that this other that is us could have the joy and the freedom of knowing him. So this love relationship that we call the triune God always existed. Look at John 17, 5. This is what Jesus says to the Father. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world began. So from all eternity, the Son shared this glory with the Father, this, this, this wonderful glory. The Father in loving the Son glorifying the Son, and the Son in loving the Father, glorifying the, the Father, and the Spirit encircling that glory as its expression and as its freedom and, and delight. And the Son is saying to the Father, now bring me as a man, Bring my embodied existence into that glory I always had with you before the worlds were made. Now show that glory in my flesh so that all flesh may partake of it. And then Jesus elaborates on this about 19 verses down in the same chapter of John where he says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. So that, that sharing of love, that sharing of glory between the Father and the Son always existed before the worlds were made. And now in time, it is revealed and opened up to us. And Jesus in the flesh conquers sin and death and wins that glory so that we in him could partake of it. On the cross and in the resurrection, he conquers sin and death. He overcomes all that hinders, and keeps us from divine love. In the cross, he breaks through that barrier, that barrier of sin, that barrier of unworthiness, that barrier of death. In his death on the cross, he breaks through those barriers so as to open a path to communion for us. He makes us worthy for communion. 
when in ourselves we are unworthy. In the cross and in the resurrection, he conquers all those doors that are closed to us. He breaks through them. And he opens a path to communion for us, making us worthy for a communion that we are not worthy of. In his victory at the cross and in the resurrection, he smashes through the barriers. And he opens a path to communion with God for us so that in him we could enjoy that communion and have it restored to us. We're not worthy. In ourselves, we could never reach it. But he opens a path for us to that communion. And he says, come with me, stand next to me, be in me. Not only will I cleanse you of your sin, but I will make you worthy of this communion and I will usher you into it. And that's exactly what Christ did. He purchased our freedom. Freedom for communion. He opened the door. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit in the virgin's womb to bear flesh that would be the perfect offering. Like it says in Luke 1.35, the Spirit will conceive of Jesus' flesh in Mary's womb. And that sanctified flesh will lead to a perfect life of faithfulness to the Father. It will lead to a life wholly dedicated to love for the Father. And sin and death will have no hold on him. And he will conquer them so as to open the path for us to know the fellowship of that communion. To commune with God and with one another in God. That is our destiny. The victory of divine communion on the cross by the eternal spirit, the son offers his life. Not only to cancel our debt, but to fulfill whatever needs to be fulfilled for us to enter into that communion. Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God on the cross. By the spirit, he offered himself unblemished to God on the cross to be that worthy sacrifice that would win for us entry into divine communion. And the victory of his resurrection by the Holy Spirit, Romans 1, 4, who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. He offers his life on the cross by the eternal spirit. He rises in the fullness of the Holy Spirit in victory over sin and death, crashing through those barriers that stand between us and God so as to open a path to communion for us. What a heavy price God paid to give us entry into that wonderful communion. So this divine communion has indeed been opened to us. Acts chapter 2. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. That Holy Spirit that encircles that love between the Father and the Son the Father in the Son, the Son in the, in the Father, in the circle of the Spirit. Now the Son takes the Spirit from the Father, pours it out upon us so that we can gain entry to that divine communion that He shares with the Father. It is not open to you. It is open to me. It is open to us. And it's not just received when you get saved but it's enjoyed every day of your life. How much time do you spend in prayer and in the Word just enjoying communion with God? Isn't communion something you should enjoy? 
What kind of husband would I be if I said to my wife, I'm so glad we got married. We can have communion with each other, but I'm too busy this week <laughs> to enjoy communion with you. Let's see if we can carve out a little time next week. Or if I were to say, you know, I just can't spend time with you because I get tired and I fall asleep. I want my Christian life to be something that I really invest in. It's the most important thing there is. There's nothing more important than that. Spend time in communion with God. Listen to his voice. Feel him speak to your soul as you read his word and pray and respond in love back again. And you will discover what life is really at its essence all about. Why should I spend all my time trying to make money that I can't take with me when I die? Well, it'll go to my kids. Well, they've got enough right now. <laughs> they don't, I don't think they need a whole lot of money from me right now. I know you got to make a living, but that's not what life is really centrally about. It's, I see it as, um, as an important sideline. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. I am an ambitious person by nature. I always tried to go to the best schools. And I went to some pretty good schools. <laughs> I've always tried to be a high motivation person. I'm what you call high motivation. I've published books. I've, you know, really invested my talents. But you can get lost in that stuff and you can forget what's really supposed to be central. Time with God sharing in that communion, hearing his voice deep in your soul and responding. This is my last slide. This love, is a, this, this, this communion of love is meant to be perfected in us and among us. That's the purpose of the church. The church is the school of divine communion. This is where we share it together, and this is where we grow in it together, and this is where it is perfected in and among us. Of course, it's perfected in our private devotions too, but it's also, it's also perfected in the communion of saints. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made perfect in us, complete in us. It achieves its goal in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. In other words, when we share that communion together, as we share it in God, as we share that communion in God, we share it with each other. And in that fellowship, the divine communion, the divine love is perfected in us. It attains its completion. It attains its goal in us. And so when we're born again, when we're born again into divine communion, we're born into a family that shares this communion together. In God, we share it together. It's not meant to be a solitary, only a solitary experience. Yes, it is a solitary experience, but it's not only that. Divine communion is not meant to be just a solitary experience. It's meant to be shared. We open up the table of fellowship to all nations to come and commune, know the love of God, 
be transformed and liberated by it. And we do that together in communion. That means being concerned about one another. That means wanting to share in one another's suffering and wanting to rejoice with one another when we are blessed. It means really being there for each other, really caring about each other, really helping to bear one another's burdens. That's part of the whole package of knowing communion in God is sharing it together. This is God's will for humanity. This is God's purpose for the human race. And the church is at the cutting edge of that new humanity. This is the purpose for which we were made. There's nothing more important. So let's invest in one another. So when people come and visit this church, they will say, love reigns here. <laughs> we see love at work here. We see the fruit of it. We see it happening all around us. These people are different <laughs> than what we get in the dog-eat-dog -dog world. This is different. Out there, it can be so graceless. Very little grace. But here they should see lots of grace. Lots of mercy. Lots of caring. Lots of forgiveness. Lots of bearing up under one another's burdens. There is nothing more important you will ever do than that. Let us pray. God, we pray, Lord. Oh, Jesus, you and the Father and the Father in you, encircled by the Spirit, may that be our goal May we move ever more deeply into it. May we own it in your grace. May it be ours. In ever new and deeper ways, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We were waiting without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise forever 
to the King of Kings. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of Kings. And the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath, till the stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in all for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel and shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit. to the King of Kings. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise for to the King of Kings. Praise forever to the King of Kings. Now may the love of the Father, the grace and freedom of the Son, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all until we meet again. Amen. Please be seated. And again, I want to thank you, Pastor Makia, for sharing God's wor uh, words in us. Uh, as the message says this morning, that as we love one another, God is in our midst. And uh, his love is uh, above all uh, human love that is un unfathomable. So, uh, so let's love one another. At the same time, we remember uh, God loves us, so we'll love to spend time with God. And uh, we have uh, refreshment in the back, and also uh, as we depart, uh, Remember to welcome our uh, new friend among us, and uh, that will be uh, the end of today's service, and go in peace. Thank you. <laughs>